Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all lines are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, please press star 1 to ask a question. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. Now we'll turn the call over to your host, Irene Iher. Ma'am, you may begin. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene Iher of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. Today's webinar will provide CDRH's perspective on digital health and will discuss the center's proposed approach to regulating products that fall under the digital health umbrella. Our discussion will include clarification of two final guidance documents as well as two draft guidance documents related to this topic. Today, Bakul Patel, Associate Director for Digital Health in CDRH, and Sugato Dex, Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of the Senate Director will provide a brief presentation. Following the presentation, we will open the line for your questions. Other center subject matter experts are also available to assist with the Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I give you the call. Thank you, Irene. Um, with that, let me just extend one other thank, uh, thanks from, from the team here at FDA and CDRH. Uh, to all attendees on the webinar. Before we start, let me talk about the objective uh, that Irene just highlighted. We also want to point out to folks that we will not be able to take uh, product-specific questions, but mostly this webinar is geared towards, you know, providing our understanding, our thinking on the guidances that we publish, um, and also give a perspective on on our approach to uh, to digital health and the guidances that we have. Uh, we have published both final and as well as draft. Um, and with that, let me start with the presentation and, and give you a little bit of background on digital health. As you can imagine, digital health technologies um, are continuously leveraging the ubiquity of connectivity, computing power, and is you know, setting up a path towards better healthcare paradigm as well as and ultimately a, a, as well as public health. With that. Today, I'm going to I'm going to cover four areas. First, we'll start off with our CDRH's vision and approach, and we'll go into the mobile medical apps guidance. That how FDA has um, taken an approach towards mobile apps and the growing area and excitement that's happening in this field. As a result of that, um, we will also use the approach that we um, that I will highlight into how we took into account. Um, Reevaluating our our existing regulations, and lastly, I will end with sort of a clarification and an overview of our draft guidances as well um, on general wellness and medical device accessories. Uh, we will take questions at the end, so please hold that as as highlighted by Irene before. Um, let me share with you, and as you can see, this is our vision for for um, which stems from uh, our mission to promote and protect public health. And, it, and I will not read all the slide, uh, the words in the slide, but if you were to glean at this, patience is at the center of our thinking. Patience is, is a center at the center of our approach. Uh, we would like to keep patients in the center and have technologies enable us to advance healthcare, advance public health. So that led us to in the area of digital health where we are using a risk-based approach which is narrowly tailored and functionality focused that gives us independence from the advances that platforms can take on. And at the same token, we want technologies to sort of innovate and that will take platforms in a different, diff, uh, to different level while promoting patient engagement, which, which gets us to a narrowly tailored approach uh, or, or narrowly tailored functionality focused approach, which leads to protecting patient safety. So that's a very, very high-level perspective and thinking of how we have approached digital health technologies, and we want to promote patient engagement at the same time protect patient safety. We are very uh, cognizant of the fact that technologies will evolve, will, will become smaller, better, cheaper, and platforms will also evolve, but focusing on technologies will allow us to promote that innovation at the same time, balance the balance, take a risk-based approach. With that, you'll see um, we had embarked on this on this uh, on this uh, thinking 
in as early as 2011-12, we started looking at mobile medical apps and we proposed our guidance on mobile medical apps. We, we said we'll focus on the traditionally regulated functionality that's either cleared, approved, or otherwise regulated. Uh, we want to provide, our goal is to provide users with the same level of assurance of patient safety. We, while we are thinking about mobile, mobile apps as a whole, we also wanted to provide people with, with the clarity uh, we, we, are, we are being asked for, is what's considered a medical device or not, what's considered lower risk, when we continue to start focusing on this narrow, on this narrow area of our oversight or narrow focus of our oversight. So in the mobile medical apps guidance that was uh, finalized in, uh, in September 2013, uh, we, set, we, divide, we provided three large areas. One area which we identified by examples which, uh, which mobile apps are not considered medical device. And the next layer up is the lower Good risk spelling. Please medical state mobile your app name. That meets device definition but may not be considered as mobile medical apps and not be a focus of our of our oversight. That leaves us with a very small area of mobile medical apps that we termed um, to represent the areas that we would focus on or areas of apps that we would focus on. And let me walk through that for a second. So here's our approach. The world of mobile apps was exploding uh, as we were working through the guidance and preparing our approach and articulating that in the document. In the guidance, we talk about types of mobile apps that are not considered medical devices and has, have no regulatory requirements or, or no FDA regulatory requirements, let me be clear on that, um, followed with a lower risk um, types of mobile apps that may meet the definition of a medical device but not considered for, um, our, for oversight. So we use the term enforcement discretion, and there was, there was a lot of discussions among what that meant, so I'll go that, over that in a second. It fundamentally means the FDA has, um, has laid out a compliance policy which articulates that we would not focus our compliance efforts on those, on those products. That leaves us with our focus of oversight where that, it, that if a mobile app that meets the two-part definition that we defined in the guidance uh, would be the focus of oversight. Very simplistically, let me just share uh, with you that things that were in a different shape, size, or form, when I say things, functionalities that were a different shape, size, or form that existed before and now happens to be in a mobile, mobile platform or a mobile way, either in, in terms of software or other ways, we would consider them to be mobile medical apps. So the definition or uh, definition sort of brings that point into play. That's the part about when mobile apps transform a mobile platform into a regular medical device. The second part of the definition was if a mobile app is now used as an accessory to a regulated medical device, we would consider that as a mobile medical app as well. Now, we define our world, the world of oversight into this very small area of what we termed as mobile medical apps. We went in the, in the guidance and highlighted three large principles of what we would consider um, to be covered in the definition of mobile medical apps. And I'm highlighted, uh, I've highlighted portions of that first, uh, first prong, or first definition, or first principle, which talks about displaying, storing, transmitting specific medical device data. And I'll, I'll share with you the reason why, why I've highlighted that, because later on as you, as I talk through the MDDS guidance, I will show that those factors sort of come into play. Um, having said that, the guidance actually goes into depth of types of mobile apps that are not medical devices, like medical flashcards, uh, finding the nearest facility, medical facility, or scheduling hospital room or bed space, are not medical devices or does not belong into the FDA jurisdiction. Things that may be considered more, uh, medical devices but not the focus of oversight are allowing people to track their own own health, um, track their health information, um, help the patient's documents show their or communicate that with the provider, their condition, all the types of things. Now, we have uh, the document is about 40 pages long um, with mostly um, filled with examples for people to sort of take away or thinking behind 
and our and our approach behind mobile mobile apps. I'm, I, we are hoping to ac accomplish this by when people come up with new technologies, when folks and innovators come up with new technologies, we would want people to glean from this guidance how we would apply and what, what we would regulate versus what we would not regulate. So as a result of, um, of all this discussion, our work in this area, through FODESIA's um, Section 618, um, we held a, um, a tri-agency work effort that led to um, um, the, the FODESIA Health IT Report, which proposed a strategy and recommendations for health IT as a, as a, as a whole. During that process, uh, through, through extensive public and work group feedback, um, we, we heard agencies, um, we heard from the stakeholders that we should, we as agencies should address ambiguities that exist in our regulations and, and that have uh, cross-cutting between other agencies. We also heard that we should be reevaluating current, re current regulations. Um, specifically in the health IT report, we, we responded by saying that we would be providing further clarity on general wellness and disease-related claims to health IT and provide more clarity on our approach towards medical device accessories are the two specific areas. But before we get into those two specific areas, let me, let me share with you what led us to the revaluation of the MDDS or medical device data systems rule. So here's what we proposed in, uh, we finalized in 2011, February 15th, is what we call as a certain types of technologies that we call as medical device data systems. They're intended by a manufacturer to transfer, storage, convert, or display medical device data, and, uh, and, and excluding those technologies that were controlling other medical devices or to be used in active patient monitoring. There is a long process that we went through that sort of high, that took public comments on what was occupation monitoring, what should be covered under MDDS. But at the end of that discussion, which started in 2008 um, and, and finalized in 2011, we highlighted what should be the narrow focus of, uh, of medical device data system rule. When you, when you look at the approach that we have highlighted in, in the health IT report, the approach that we have taken in the mobile medical apps guidance, and our philosophy of how to um, promote patient engagement and protect patients at the same time promote um, the functionality dependent and not uh, platform dependent and take a risk-based approach, we, we took a harder look at the medical device data systems rule. And here's what we come and, – and in addition to that, we looked at medical image storage and communication device rules as well. And we concluded that these types of products or these types of products identified in the regulations were generally considered low risk and were already classified as class one. Systems that record, share, and use medical device data have become very it become a significant portion of the connected healthcare system. It also drives towards intercommunication of functionality, which is foundational for interoperability of the medical device data and the digital health ecosystem. Into June 2014, we provided, we proposed a guidance which basically um, said we will take a uh, hands-off approach towards these types of um, devices that were identified in medical device data systems, medical image storage, and communication uh, regulations. Our intent was to continue to provide the clarity in digital health narrow or focus on higher risk product, and also, um, more importantly, create an impetus for devices to share data and ultimately become interoperability in this larger health IT slash digital health ecosystem. So fast forward, um, after a public comment, here's what we heard back from the, from the stakeholders. Most comments, we received about 500 plus comments to the medical device data system uh, draft guidance. Um, most supported the, the re-regulatory policy for MDGS, um, suggested specific edits, edits to, lang uh, to clarify the language, and also asked us to uh, be clear on what we meant by active patient monitoring. And some actually did ask us to finalize and make, make 
uh, if a permanent regulation and not just the guidance. We thought that going down, uh, go, going further and finalizing the guidance would provide the next level of certainty for folks. In response to the feedback in the final guidance, um, we maintained the proposed policy without any changes. Um, we added additional language in the background section addressing the comments that we received to explaining to folks what we meant by medical device divided data systems. Um, as we said in the final rule, also clarified what we, what, with examples, clarified what we meant by active patient monitoring. So you should find that, that helpful. Um, we did also propose in the draft medical device data system guidance that we would make conforming edits to the mobile medical app guidance as well so they are consistent with the policy described in the MGDS guidance. So we made those changes as well. So here's what the final guidance looks like. And I'm, um, the, the final guidance published on February 9, 2015 um, clarifies our intent or confirms our intent that we would not enforce compliance with regulatory controls that apply to, the, to MDDS, to medical image storage devices, and medical image communication devices. Um, we did also say that in the guidance, MDDS, as we said in our final rule, MDDS rule, that these products are not intended for uh, for activation monitoring or modified, modified medical device data or controlled medical devices. Um, that is, cons again, consistent with the rule that we had. The MDDS guidance confirmed or the scope of products that fit MDDS as defined in the rule, the guidance just extends and enforce our uh, uh, compliance policy for that for those products identified in those rules. So I wanted to make make sure that folks understood that. So let me share what we did in the mobile medical apps guidance as well. As you notice, I'd highlighted a few words in the first uh, principle in the mobile medical apps guidance that we would would consider mobile medical apps. And this is how we edited that language, which is what we had proposed in the draft as well. And we also moved the types of MDBS type functionalities into the category of, of enforcement discretion or things that we would not um, enforce compliance towards. Um, while this was happening, FDA had, uh, and CDRH had um, maintained a website and a, a a email address that folks could ask questions on uh, on specific products. We updated the guidance with those additional examples that we had added to the uh, to the website as well. Um, and when I mentioned the email address, it was the mobile medical apps at fta.hhs.gov. This email address was intended to provide quick triage and so sort of clarification on our, our approach and uh, product specific answers to uh, whether a product would fit into one of this, one of the three categories highlighted in the guidance or not. Um, as a result of the process that we went through an extensive public, public input, we, we have, um, we have the website that we promised to keep it, um, keep it live, keep it, uh, keep it current with the examples and the, and the questions that we get. But also internally, we have we have set up a um, a committee that would that would provide coordination to maintain uh, consistent policy decisions related to mobile medical apps, um, and that's the email address that we we use for folks to ask questions um, to us that that gets looked over by a dedicated um, team, dedicated staff that who maintains uh, policy decisions consistent. With that, let me turn over to the two draft guidances that um, that I mentioned earlier, continuing our clarity in the world of digital health, and continuing our our thinking and the approach that we have that I highlighted in the beginning of being risk-based, functionality-focused, and narrowly tailored. Um, general wellness guidance was something that that was requested, and we had committed to providing clarity on how FDA slash CDRA specifically for devices and technologies would consider general wellness products and what claims we would, we would be allowed. So let me just walk through some of, some of the highlights of the guidance um, 
the policy does not intend to examine, we said in the guidance, we don't intend to examine whether products that are either considered low risk are medical devices or not. We are, we are fundamentally saying if they're devices, we don't intend to, if general wellness products are devices or meet the definition of the FTNC Act, Section 201H, we, will, we don't, as FDA, intend to enforce compliance or regulatory requirements. So what are the products covered? Products intended only for general wellness use are covered in this guidance. Products inherently present a very low risk to user safety. If you look at the guidance, it will probably highlight, you you understand what we meant by very low risk. Um, and and what we meant by there was not not have uh, invasive or have a irreversible effect on human body. So that's one of the one of the principles in the guidance as well. Products intended for general wellness use can be marketed. In other words, can claim without obviously without any reference to disease or conditions, we would consider them general wellness products. But when such products with a general disease related general wellness claims contain references that is well understood that a healthy lifestyle may reduce the risk of impact would be con would also be considered as a low risk. So I wanted to highlight that very specific point for people to sort of understand what the policy sort of articulates. Um, I'm going to pause it right here, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sugado Day, which Irene, uh, who Irene introduced earlier, and he's going to talk a little bit about an, an overview on the accessories guidance. Sugado? Thank you, Bakul. The draft guidance on medical device accessories was issued on January 20th of this year. This document is intended to clarify the definition of the term accessory and to propose a risk-based framework to classify these devices. More specifically, the guidance proposes utilization of the de novo classification process to allow manufacturers or other parties to seek risk-based classification of accessories of a new type. As you can see on this slide, CDRH defines accessories as devices intended to support, supplement, or augment the performance of one or more parent devices. In brief, the device supports the performance of a parent device by enabling or facilitating that device to perform according to its intended use. The device supplements the performance of the parent device if it adds a new function or a new way of using the parent device without changing its intended use. Lastly, a device augments the performance of the parent device by enabling it to perform its intended use more safely and effectively. Once an article has been determined to be an accessory, the FDA plans to proceed to consider the risk of the accessory when used as intended and what level of regulatory controls are necessary to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. This risk-based analysis is the same that is used in the classification of any medical device. In practice, an accessory is either classified in the same class as the parent device or is classified in a different classification, either lower or higher. In some situations, an accessory may have a lower risk profile than that of the parent device and therefore may warrant being regulated in a lower class. The last section of the guidance outlines how the de novo classification process can be used to request risk-based classification of new types of accessories. This process provides a pathway to class one or class two classification for which general controls or general and specific controls provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, but for which there are no legally marketed parent devices. The guidance lays out the recommended content for such a de novo submission. I'll now hand it back to the call. Thanks, Sugaro. Um, I do want to remind folks that the draft of general wellness guidance and the draft accessory guidance are proposals, and um, the intent of this webinar and the discussion that we want to have today is to solicit comments towards those guidances and, and suggest if people have ideas on suggesting better, either better clarifying um, the guidance or make it clear for folks who can who are implementing or using the guidance would be very helpful as you as you submit comments to the docket. Um, I do want to remind folks uh, both um, the general wellness as well as the draft accessories guidance comments are due by April 20th, 2015. So uh, we would we would hope uh, folks would actually provide us input um, so we can turn around and finalize the guidance based on that input. Um, I want to sum take take this this presentation and now summarize where the, the center is heading for digital health. We believe digital health will be beneficial and drive better health health outcomes at the end of the day. 
we also believe that it will enable patient, patient empowerment and help everybody in the healthcare ecosystem to drive efficient healthcare decisions. Um, our policies, um, I'll reiterate again, are towards promoting patient engagement technologies, continuing to provide regulatory clarity by using a focused regulatory approach, and really um, working with stakeholders to understanding their needs and expectations so we can better articulate um, how we as CDRH can play a, a, a role in, in promoting and protecting public health. Um, with that, uh, let, um, let me pause right here. Um, this is where uh, we can start the question and answer session. Um, again, I would like to remind folks that we will be taking questions on clarification on the guidances. We have specific product-related questions. Um, uh, we can also connect later on. We can connect, talk to DICE uh, or email DICE at fda.hhs.gov or a contact, um, contact DICE through their phone line. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Irene. We'll now take questions. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Unmute your phone and record your name when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted. One moment for the first question, please. We do have our first question. Greg Fulbachan, your line is open. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, if you could, if you could just uh, sort of walk everybody through um, how you see the dividing line between FDA and FTC when it comes to regulating mobile apps. I ask that question because, as you're well aware, uh, FTC seems to be taking a very active role lately in cracking down on um, unsubstantiated claims that are made by uh, marketers and manufacturers of uh, mobile health apps. And uh, it seems almost as if that, that uh, FDA is sort of deferring to FTC um, when it comes to these kinds of actions. So, so, so what's your perspective? Yeah, so Greg, thanks for the question. Um, I, I can definitely you know, talk about FDA, but I'm, uh, I won't be able to talk about uh, FTC's uh, role and perspective and their, um, and as, as you mentioned, they're taking an active role or not. That's, that's definitely not uh, an FDA pur on FDA purview. But the way I can, I can just share with you, we, FDA and FTC have traditionally worked together on, on many, many other products. So um, F FTC has a very defined focus on on promoting promote, promotion and advertising, and we have a very specific role in in where the lines are for promoting and and uh, promotion and advertising from a public health perspective. So those that's where the role are. I'm I'm not sure um, there is there's a large overlap in terms of the scientific evidence that. We require for clearing and approving products. That's a different different discussion. Um, but that's where we generally focus focus from a public health perspective. Um, and as you may may recall, this is not the first time FDA uh, FTC has has taken interest in uh, in mobile apps specifically. Um, but in other cases, in previously in 2011, and 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 they also had had taken some actions. But that has nothing to do with where FDA's jurisdiction stops and where FTC's jurisdiction starts. We'll now take the next question. Thank you. And the next question is from Nathaniel Greer. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Thank you. So how – can you speak maybe to how this is going to impact – uh, such technologies as uh, patient reported outcomes in clinical research uh, with the uh, you know bringing your own device and so deploying apps to to potential subjects in clinical research and have it and that how that interacts with the clinical research space um, I so from my very simplistic perspective 
and in the world of digital health, I believe uh, as as in other other studies and other research areas, um, technology has sort of become an enabler towards collecting that information. I, from my perspective, I think it, digital health technologies will will get us to the next level of technology enabling patient reported outcomes, and that may be just one part of the research that needs that will happen and and sort of bring more information to the table as as a, as decisions for evidence come together. So I, I guess maybe more specifically then from a perspective of the <clears throat> the app itself, obviously we have to look at the perspective of what the data is being collected and how it's being collected in the mobile app and to what it would fall underneath. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, from a compliance perspective, from a med device perspective? Yeah, so uh, if you're talking specifically about clinical research, um, when I meant tools, there are just different tools that you use in clinical research, and you may have to look at what those those requirements are for clinical research using mobile tools or or, or other other techniques that may end up in the patient reported outcome. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Your next question is from Bernie Bosley. Your line is open. I was wondering if FDA is looking to define consensus standards around MMAs like they do for other product and therapies. Reason I ask is I assume there are there are still some standards that apply to MMAs, you know, like the HIPAA or NAST cybersecurity. Um, the ISO risk standards and things along those lines? So in general, um, I would suggest this is before. And I would, so we do work on, on standards on, uh, on various platforms and various technologies. And when I, when I use the description of functionality focus, we, we really want to be ubiquitous on types of platforms and technologies that exist. And if, if standards exist for what techniques should be used for protecting uh, certain types of platforms or technology, we would, we would probably rely on those. But, so I guess the answer is um, we we don't have I don't have a specific standard data that I can point towards that we are working towards. But yes, if cybersecurity is val valuable and an important consideration for an uh, for an device that previously existed in other forms. We would expect the same, some same kind of application of that particular consideration in the mobile app as well. Okay, thank you. And your next question is from Patricia Bass. Your line is open. Yes, my question concerns the person who's sitting in the IRB compliance arena, and I'm trying to understand how this would affect our looking at mobile devices or under the that guidance or under the proposed guidance, if a device is considered in the enforcement discretion area, does that mean that as an IRB looking at these kinds of devices or not devices that are under development but under clinical investigation, that if a device all things considered, is going to be under discretion that an IRB would not have to think about deciding whether something is a non-significant risk device because it's in the enforcement discretion category. Is that correct? Let me hand it over to Linda Ritchie, who is from Office of Device Evaluation, and can probably also answer this question. Good afternoon. Uh, I think your question is getting uh, more at the definition of a non-significant risk study, and that's more related to um, how uh, this technology might be used to help patients, um, and that's a little different than how we would uh, regulate the, uh, the device itself. So um, in terms of, uh, from my perspective, about what the IRB would need to do with these devices, um, you would still need to evaluate the safe use of these devices uh, regardless of the um, um, regulatory paradigm 
um, that FDA would, would come up with these. You know, in those times when we say something's under enforcement discretion, we believe that the um, uh, use of those devices is low risk. Uh, so you can certainly um, uh, use that as part of your decision-making process. But as to whether it's a non-significant risk study, I think that's a different question. Well, but the, actually the device itself, because once you make that determination, then that's deemed an, an IDE. So I was just trying to think that in terms of making that determination, if it's not going to be considered a device, we would not need to make that determination, apart from its level of risk, say, as used in the study. This is Brendan O'Leary in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. One thing I want to highlight is that none of these guidances redefine what meets the legal definition of a device. These simply uh, discuss our enforcement priorities. So the determination that a device or, or that a product is under enforcement discretion does not affect whether or not it meets the definition of a device. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And the next question is from Robert McCray. Your line is open. Yeah, I, uh, good afternoon, uh, McCool. Um, I have two questions. Uh, I think they're related, though. Uh, one on NDDS and one on the wellness guidance. And they're related to your, how you can think about risk. Um, so with NDDS, I'm curious for a little more of uh, your feedback on how you, um, why you are excluding active monitoring, um, and specifically perhaps the relevance of uh, the environment where the monitoring takes place because it's, I think your risk um, is different in a hospital and at home. Um, and I'm thinking specifically that, you know, the risk of not being monitored for a patient who cannot be in a hospital um, is actually higher than, uh, uh, than, than, than um, being monitored by a, a, pro, a, a project or a program that is not uh, perfect. Uh, and that we you know, essentially expect in hospitals. Um, similarly, in wellness, the elimination of any reference to any disease or condition, I'm just wondering how um, the, uh, the companies promoting these apps and, and software can actually gain the attention of customers uh, without even mentioning, um, you know, the diseases that, uh, that the industry believes uh, can be avoided through better lifestyle. Yeah, no, thanks, Rob. So let me tackle your first question on medical device data systems. Um, so part one answer to that question is, is fundamentally that we have defined MDDS as in a certain way that excluded active patient monitoring uh, as part of the rulemaking process. So this guidance fundamentally just says that that particular definition as defined in the medical device data system, which already had excluded active patient monitoring um, is, is applicable here um, for, for our enforcement priorities as Brendan had highlighted earlier. Um, and to, to just give you a little bit of color on what's considered active patient monitoring, it is not about location of where that active patient monitoring is happening. And it could be happening in a home or in, uh, somewhere else or a clinic, but it's more about um, if you look at the definitions, um, not the definition, but the background um, that we had provided in the in the guidance, <clears throat> it, it boils down to um, in any device that is intended to be relied upon in, de in deciding to take an immediate clinical action. The key words there are immediate clinical action. And immediate clinical action can extend many places, and it's not about in a home setting versus not. Or it's not about monitoring um, like people use the word monitoring in a very large extent, we actually try to narrow that down to a very specific application area of monitoring as you would imagine a bedside monitor, for example. So think, I would, I would encourage you guys to think about that. Um, on the general wellness part, I'm not sure whether um, uh, I understood the question. In fact, uh, we are allowing, or the proposal on the table is we are allowing when technologies um, are, are intended to promote a healthy lifestyle, but also show through, uh, through well understood literature or well understood science that those healthy, that healthy lifestyle are linked 
to managing diseases or conditions. Well, we are saying that would also be included under something that we would consider low risk general illness devices. Okay, well, thanks for the clarification on NTDS. On the wellness, um, and I, maybe I mis misinterpreted the, um, the draft guidance and your slide deck, does it seem to indicate that any reference to a specific disease uh, would uh, change the, the your, your thinking about uh, the, um, the 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 product? Uh, no. So there are two parts. We would, any general wellness products that are meant to promote healthy lifestyle, without any claims of disease, would be a lot, would be considered low risk. The part two of what we would consider low risk is products that promote healthy lifestyle. And, and and when it's known, well known that healthy lifestyle has a correlation to, uh, you know, helping certain types of disease or conditions, we'd also consider health, um, low risk. It's the right. healthy lifestyle correlated to the disease or condition. It's not the product. So you have to think, yeah. keep that linkage in mind. This may be offense. Okay, thank you. And your next question is from Christina Thomas. Your line is open. Hi, I have a question um, with regards to um, the MDDS. In the past, part of the FDA MDDS definition was in, uh, it contained in, uh, the, the part that information could only flow in one direction from a source medical device through the MDDS to the target location. And if there's bidirectional information flow, it would no longer be considered an MDDS. Um, what I want to know is, is this still the case um, that it's only one way, direct, you know, one directional, unidirectional, or, um, and if that is the case, can you further clarify bidirectional, bidirectional information flow? Um, so by that, as an example, I mean I'm coming from the source device through the MDDS to a destination device and then back from a destination device through the MDDS back to the source device. Thank you. So let me, I think you may be referring to the proposed rule that we had done in 2008 where we had talked about the unidirectional mode. When we finalized the rule after public comments, we changed, um, trans, uh, the, we used the word transfer of medical device data where we intended to, inc to indicate transfer can be in either direction of, of the data flowing. Um, very simplistically, you can think about MDDS as conduits that take data from point A to point B. Uh, that's how you would think about it as transfer without actually modifying that data. Okay, that makes it clear. Thank you. Your next question is from AJ Shrek. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, my question may have more to do with what uh, I believe was Robert asked previously with regards to general wellness, uh, but if an app was specifically targeting a disease condition, would the device manufacturer or app manufacturer be able to specify what that condition is, or is the draft guidance uh, veering more towards not allowing a specified condition for these apps? So um, I'm not sure whether you have the guidance in front of you, but I can probably actually point to you uh, the two specific um, uh, types of products that we, we, we said. We, uh, what we are allowing marketing claims to be is may help reduce the risk of certain chronic disease or may help living well with certain chronic, chronic disease. But it's the healthy lifestyle may help reduce the risk of or healthy lifestyle may help living well with. The key point is if products are promoting healthy lifestyle, we would consider it as low risk. And if the marketing claim includes healthy lifestyle may help reduce the risk of or healthy lifestyle may help living well with, we would still consider them to be low risk. Low risk. Thank you. And the next question is from Tracy Fox. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, Bukul, you mentioned that there was a comment on the draft MDDX guidance to permanently update the regulation. Can you tell us if there are any short-term or long-term plans to actually do that? Right now, um, 
we did receive some comments about um, <clears throat> finalizing or updating or creating some other mechanism to um, uh, to either create a new regulations or something else. Uh, however, at this time, we thought uh, finalizing the guidance itself would provide the immediate clarity that people were seeking for and provide and lead and pave a path towards. Uh, I'm. I cannot discuss at this time whether we have future plans on where, um, how we would go about doing this, um, or if we were going to go about doing this. But at this point, our our intention was to provide the immediate uh, sort of guidance and finalization for both folks in the industry as well as our staff to be able to or enable FDA to uh, to uh, implement this policy that we already, uh, we had proposed last year. Okay, thank you. I think your next question is from Robert Cruz. Your line is open. Hi, uh, my question is with respect to the draft guidance for accessories. So uh, I'm wondering if you could provide additional clarification for the proposed policy and confirm my understanding that this is kind of advocating for an independence of classification between the parent device and accessory. Now, the second part of that question would be, um, has it been considered, given this forum, packed on other guidances such as um, for 510K submissions of software and the software level of concern? So this is Segato Day. To answer the first part of your question, you, you are correct. The guidance is intended to separate the risk-based analysis for accessories alone versus their parent device. The accessory is considered as used with the parent device, but the, it could be very possible that the accessory might be determined to have a different risk categorization than that of the parent device. So that is a departure from, you know, what, what's currently done in this space, where most often accessories are usually regulated with their parent devices currently. The, the answer to the second part of your question is, for uh, 510Ks for software accessories, we're not going to differentiate software accessories from accessories. Accessories have their definition as stated in the guidance. You know, it says to support, supplement, or augment the performance of the parent device. That would also apply to a, a software accessory. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for your indication. And so this is Bakul. I just want to add to what Sagado just mentioned. And if you have other uh, – I, I heard you say about the 510K uh, sort of implications of this guidance. As as you look at the guidance and sort of digest it and sort of digest information as, as of today, if you think there are things that we should consider as part of the finalization of the guidance, please please make sure that you provide that suggestions in the in the comments. Yeah, I will make sure to do that more specifically around the software level of concern where, where my uh, kind of questions stem from. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is from Zach Rothstein. Your line is open. Hi, and uh, thanks to Paul and everyone else at FDA for your time today. Uh, my question relates back to the second category of general wellness products, and that's those that – make claims based on scientific evidence. You know, I think it's great that CDRH has taken this position. Um, but my question is, have you thought about taking it a step further, uh, like CIPSAN does in the food space for qualified health claims, uh, something like how Cheerios is marketed as good for your heart? Um, so it seems to me that if you kind of had a set of what are essentially pre-approved claims based on scientific evidence, uh, both small and large manufacturers wouldn't need to always research and find and determine whether scientific evidence exists and is sufficient for those claims? Uh, great, great question. I think of, uh, we did think through that, and our approach was uh, given our resources and given our workload, we wanted to be very clear up front, and we were not planning on having a separate program that we would evaluate uh, the validity of the scientific claims, and, and that's that's an area that we did consider. But, again, if you guys have thoughts on how to best approach it without having, um, you know, CDRH review every single claim that comes through, especially given the volume of mobile apps that may be there that may actually help uh, living pe help people with living a healthy, healthier lifestyle, 
um, that that's the consideration we had to balance. And again, back to my foundational principles of being narrowly tailored and focused, and you know, functionality focus is what we were heading towards. Right. Thanks. And the next question is from Troy Jack. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, Nicole. Thank you for uh, sponsoring this today. So uh, we actually have two questions from my side. Uh, the first question is surrounding uh, the last page of the MVDS uh, guidance document, which is uh, page eight. And uh, in that on that page, it states that um, FDA does not intend to enforce compliance with the regulatory controls, including registration listing, quality system regula regu uh, quality system regulation, et cetera. So um, our first question is, are, are manufacturers still required to comply with these regulatory controls, even if the FDA does not intend to enforce uh, compliance with those controls? And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Sure. Um, I, you said you had multiple questions. I was waiting for more, but I'll answer this one. Um, yeah, so our intent here is not to, uh, not to uh, enforce if people are in compliance or not uh, for for complying with those regulations, that um, I can't I can't tell you whether to uh, whether to do those things on their own because we thought at one point in time for sure the uh, following quality system, for example, quality system regulation is generally good for other uh, for other reasons. Um, so this only sort of confirms our policy going forward that um, regardless. We would not be enforcing compliance towards this regulation. Okay. Second question. So the, hi, my name is Shelley A. Stryker. The second question that we had, please, was whether or not the devices that fall in these regulations, also on page eight, are they still considered to be devices if there will not be, um, you know, if, if there will not be compliance with regulatory controls in force. Are they still considered devices? So um, I think Brendan may have answered this in, as in previous previous context. These regulations are um, are basically saying these products are medical devices under the Section 201H of the FDNC Act. Um, the guidance provides a, a compliance policy and our enforcement policy in very good they would enforce compliance towards these these products or not. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, if people who are asking questions can come closer to the phone, this, uh, this webinar is, is transcribed, so um, it can be clearly recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Your, next question. Your next question is from Kathy Franca. Your line is open. Yes, my uh, question may have just been answered. Is the FDA still requiring an MDS device to be included in the manufacturer registration and uh, and device listing? Uh, we would not be enforcing our compli compliance towards people who, uh, for that particular requirement. So if we already have an MDS that is, in fact, uh, listed, um, the next time we register, we'll be we be pulling it off. Would that that be all right? I will. I will go back to my standard answer. We will not be enforcing compliance to that. Okay. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Sarah Baker. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, sorry. Okay. Could you comment on labeling distribution, specifically with reference to patient labeling as part of the mobile medical application? Um, would it be acceptable to provide the patient labeling as part of the mobile medical application? Um, not sure I follow the question, but I'll attempt. Now there's, I'm looking at others to see if they follow the question. But um, uh, the types of labeling for, for example, if there was a mobile app that is that would be regulated as a class two medical device and requires review, um, I think as part of the review we would have to discuss with the branch and the reviewer what format 
type media is acceptable for patient labeling. Okay. So it depends. It's more on specific circumstances and the scenario. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And your next question is from Edward Mortney. Your line is open. Uh, you actually answered my question. Thank you, though. And the next question is from Kathleen Bacon. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if on the uh, classification under the triangle where they're considered low risk but still devices, then because it's part of the software development, do we have to go ahead and translate towards design control if we're already validating through agile processes? Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, so the middle portion is what you're referring to uh, in the triangle. Correct, and sir. Th those products, those products are are again under the enforcement policy of not for FDA not um, are making a very clear statement. We would not be enforcing uh, regulatory requirements for the for that types of product that fit in that in that area. So. The answer is I'm not sure uh, where you're heading with the question, but that's really what we are saying is uh, we are not going to enforce compliance. Okay. Okay. I, I think that clarifies it a little bit because essentially because it is, if it is a device and because it does fall under software, um, the processes for the development of that software is slightly different than the standard linear process of medical device lifecycle development. So because the processes are different, then that suggests that we don't need to do the, 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 the software definition of, say, something like design transfer because that technically doesn't exist in software development. You are validating the software as you are creating design input. So in theory, you would not have to translate that to medical device um, design history file. It, it could stay as agile software development in just, it could essentially be any software. Uh, so my recommendation to you would be is follow the best practice that suits for your business processes to maintain, you know, whatever requirements you you have for safety, et cetera, um, that, that makes sense for you to, for, for the design process. But it boils down to is, again, um, let me reiterate, the triangle is a, great uh, depiction of our our focus in the area of mobile app uh, if you're if you're trying to figure out what to do in um, in the gray the middle area versus the lower where it's non medical devices area uh, it's it's not something that we are we are pay, we are focusing our energy on i think as you get closer towards the line towards the top of the pair for the triangle where it becomes a mobile medical app versus under enforcement discretion, I think that's where you can engage FDA to have this conversation. But and and the and the email address I provided on mobile medical app at fda.hhs.gov is a great place to ask those kind of questions. But at the same time, I would encourage people to think um, not to do things because you know there are regulations, but think think what's best for the product and for the patients. Okay, I appreciate your time. That clarifies it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Michael Sias. Your line is open. All right. Thank you. Uh, my question was actually just answered. Thanks. And the next question is from Jody Coleman. Your line is open. Hi. Regarding the uh, guidance for MDDS, medical image storage devices, and medical image communication devices, is it correct then to assume that these devices will not be required to be registered in the Global Unique Device Identification Database? Um, I may have to differ on that, but really on a very broad, uh, you can probably ask the question to DICE, but at the, at a very high level, I would, uh, I would, I would say that since we are not enforcing regulations on, on those devices, we would not expect the same, we would, we would probably have the same, uh, approach towards other, other regulations such as UDI. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Anita Walker. Your line is open.
Panillo, please check your mute button. Your line is open. And the next question is from Lee Blackter. Your line is open. Uh, yes. I would like to ask about um, the use of a an MDDS or an MM, MMA that is used in conjunction, that is considered a device, that is used in conjunction with a drug, either to record uh, drug values or used by the user in some way in conjunction with their drug therapy. Does the fact that this is a device used with a drug make this a product combination product? And if it does, does it in any way change the enforcement discretion or the application of the regulations as you have described in these guidances? Um, I'm having a hard time thinking on the spot so that an example of what you just described, but uh, uh, I think this would also be a great question to ask either in the mobile medical inbox to, uh, to tease that out. And like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a team, team here of senior leadership that get together on a regular basis to discuss these kind of issues. And if this is one area we need to provide clarity, we would, we would, we would discuss this and, and provide clarity. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Shuri Kotrick. Your line is open. Hi, uh, this is Shri Kaushik. Uh, first off, uh, everybody from CDRHN Buckle, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I'm, I mean, uh, my question stems from all the discussions that just happened, and I'm sort of confused. Um, the fact that uh, the enforcement description, uh, sorry, discretion mobile apps are considered to be medical devices, but FDA is saying they're not going to um, do enforcement, doesn't preclude them from register and listing because uh, class one devices also have to register and list and also have to have uh, design controls. Uh, am I missing something where I, um, I mean, the answers I heard seem to suggest that that is not a requirement for an app that falls within the enforcement, uh, um, you know, discretion of FDA. Of, of FDA. Um. So there's, we, we can dive down to deep conversation on this, but, but fundamentally it boils down to is um, you may, folks and manufacturers may choose to comply with the regulations. Um, and what all we are saying is um, that's not an area that we, uh, that we would be focusing our enforcement uh, resources on. No, no, I, I understand that that's not the area that you guys are focusing on, but it, what you're saying is coming off of as a manufacturer doesn't have to actually register and list, at least to me. I don't know if anybody else has the same confusion. Uh, but that's how I'm hearing it, and I'm not sure if I'm hearing it correctly. It's very bad. So, uh, um, so it's as a class one device, yes? MDDS, MDDS is a class one device, and if, if there is requirements that are not met by a certain manufacturer, and, and it could include um, the ones listed in the guidance, we would not be enforcing or we would not be requiring compliance to those. Okay, I guess I, I guess I have to ask this question to Dice because, again, I'm still hearing that we don't have to register and list, and also follow design controls because you're not going to enforce it. But that goes against the class one general controls requirements that are in the, you know, for, for any de medical, any device considered to be a medical device. Yeah, you, so, you can go ahead and ask the question to DICE or, um, um, or the mobile medical apps in email as well, and we can get back to you. Thank you. And your next question is from Kelly Wynn. Your line is open. Um, relative to the MDS, MDDS guidelines, um, I think previously it called out specifically that plotting um, data graphically um, was excluded from the MDDS classification. Is that still the case? Could you speak to that a little? Yes. Um, so MD, um, MDDS, MDDS regulations don't include plotting of data. 
It's the display of exact data that's generated by the medical device. However, if you take MDBS in combination with the policy described in the mobile medical app guidance, you 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 would see that combination of plotting it data along with transferring the data is sort of fits into the same consistent approach that highlighted in in either the mobile medical app guidance or and in uh, MDBS guidance. Okay, so just to clarify, so if we take data, transport, transport it from a device and plot it graphically, that would fall under the MDDS guidelines? <laughs> so, um, not, not, no. So, MDDS guidelines are specifically um, talking about the definition of MDDS and the MDDS regulation. So, MDDS regulation defines an MDDS to do certain functionality. There are other functionalities like plotting, et cetera, with the data that the MDDS, which is responsible for transferring or storing, were highlighted in the mobile medical apps guidance that we also said would be under enforcement discretion. All I'm saying is if you, if you are plotting data but you're taking data and having a functionality that takes data from a medical device, those two functionalities in combina taken together um, as a general approach from CDRH um, would be under enforcement discussion, uh, and they could come from as a combination of the MDDS guidance as well as the mobile medical app guidance. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Marat Daka. Your line is open. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, one, with regard to patient monitoring, uh, are devices that provide secondary or tertiary alarm notification subject um, to MDDS or not? And secondly, um, if a company only has devices that fall within the spectrum of um, items that you've mentioned in these guidance documents um, and nothing else, are they subject to establishment registration and inspections or not. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Linda Ritchie again. I'm only going to cover the first part of your question um, with regards to secondary or tertiary systems for monitoring. Um, if the systems for secondary or tertiary monitoring are used in active patient monitoring, then they still would be actively regulated as the primary monitoring system. Uh, an example of this is, is uh, like a nurse call station in a hospital that is connected to the um, uh, uh, primary monitoring system at the patient's bedside. Those types of secondary monitors are still actively monitored um, as they're used for active patient monitoring. Um, can you repeat the second half of your question, please? Um, are entities that have devices that fall within these two guidance documents only require to re register as an establishment and subject to inspections. Um, as we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to mobile medical apps guidance and MDDS guidance, I take it. Yes. Um, and if, so if a product that is considered a mobile medical app that is the top of the triangle, that we would focus or or focus our oversight on, um, they would still be subject to the same regular rules and enforcement policies that we have today for other class one, class two, class three devices. Um, things below that that line on the top tip of the triangle, either it fits in either that functionality or types of products are in the in the other categories outside of the small triangle, or it fits into the medical device. Uh, medical device data system uh, guidance would all we're saying is in, if you fall there, uh, if your product falls there, we would not we would not enforce, which means that include enforce enforcement means infractions as well. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is from Ryan Meyer. Yeah, hi there. Um, so I'll try and answer this so that it makes sense, but I'm kind of hearing a couple different things, and this goes back to a couple questions with the gentleman who had some confusion. And it, it sounds like there's a set of rules, right, that apply to a medical device, um, you know, class one, mobile medical device, or MDDS, whatever. Um, 
Are you saying these rules don't apply, or are you saying they're just not going to enforce these rules? The latter. Okay, so I mean that's kind of to me that's almost. I mean, without it sounding bad, but I mean it's it's kind of like talking out of both sides of your mouth, right? Saying, okay, well, you know, this stuff applies. We're not going to come out and make sure that you're doing it, but you know, what if something bad happens? Then all of a sudden, is it like, oh wait, you should have been following this to begin with? I mean, it just sounds like you're not taking a proactive approach and going out to enforce, but hey, you better have a quality system and, and register and do all of that stuff, design, development controls, the, the whole work, that that's going to be the case. This is about focusing the resources that we have. I think we're taking the approach that, you know, we're not going to exercise active enforcement discretion. This is kind of analogous to maybe a local police department saying, we're not going to issue a ticket for going five miles over the speed limit. The law still says you can't go over the speed limit. You as a company, in this case as a driver, you have to make the decision, am I going to go over the speed limit or not? The, the, sure. company, the, the department just saying, you know, we won't give you a ticket. It's still your decision. And it's probably, you know, it's probably in your best interest to do it. It's just we're not going to, you know, actively apply enforcement discretion. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so uh, is there a scenario where you would enforce it? Uh, so as we had articulated in our mobile app guidance, we, we have said that um, we would engage in an open public um, dialogue and feedback uh, if we were to change that decision. in light of other information that we have collected. You're saying if you were to change a decision about not actively enforcing? Correct. So until you guys come back to some public dialogue, nobody's getting busted for breaking the speed limit? <laughs> in the world, yes. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I suppose that adds some clarification, but doesn't seem to alleviate anything that we need to be doing on this side if we want to make sure that we're managing our risk. We expect you to manage your risk as you would normally do in other ways for other types, other reasons. All we're saying is from a regulatory perspective and our compliance perspective, uh, we, would, we would be not um, focusing in that area. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question for today's call is from David Hirschhorn. Your line is open. Hi, this is Dr. David Hirschhorn, a radiologist. Um, I noticed that out of the, the mobile medical apps uh, uh, definition, you said you said that you struck the word display from there. So where does that leave us with regard to displaying medical images on mobile devices, uh, both for clinical reference and for primary diagnosis? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon here. Hi, this is Brendan O'Leary again in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. We do have some language in the mobile medical applications guidance on uh, display of radiological images on page 25. We say that mobile apps that are not intended for diagnostic image review, and I provide some more specific examples of that, would be considered medical image communications devices, which the medical device data systems guidance now puts under enforcement discretion. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. Okay. That clarifies it. Thank you. Thanks, David. And there are no other questions in queue at this time. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's recording, along with the slide presentation and transcript, will be available on the CDRH webinar page at www fda.gov forward slash CDRH webinar by Thursday, March 5th. If you have additional questions about the final and or get draft guidance documents, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for participating. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.